thankful for good worship. Uh, have you heard of, of what they call uh, phantom vibration syndrome? Have, have you heard of this phantom vibration syndrome? Let me explain it to you. There was recently, <coughs> there was, a, uh, there was a, a survey of college students and uh, it came out that 89% of college students have experienced phantom vibration syndrome. And Josh, if you get the lights when you get a chance. And this phantom vibration syndrome is when you think your phone has notified you of something and you look at it and there was actually no notification there. You think you got a notification, but, but there's no notification. You reach out and it, I, I, I thought, did, did you hear my phone? Did you? Did, did, did my phone? And they're like, no, no, no. They call that phantom vibration syndrome. We, we, we experience something that we're expecting, but it's not actually there. We, 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 we experience life through a lens of what we Hallelujah. We, we, we experience life through the lens of what we are expecting. And so we are expecting, of course, I have a cell phone. People will be wanting to reach me at all times. And so we get these, vibe, these, these, these notifications that aren't actually, actually there. Have, have you noticed that? This is, this is what life is like. And so as Jesus walked the earth, Jesus, Jesus had a, a radical message for his disciples. Jesus was a a radical preacher because he was always teaching counter to what they were expecting. They had, they, had, they had phantom Messiah syndrome. They expected the Messiah to come and do something that the Messiah was not planning on doing at all. And so as you see the conflict in scriptures with all the people around him, they fought with Jesus because they were expecting Messiah to do something Jesus came to do something radically different. As we look back in history, it's kind of hard for us at times to understand why they hated Jesus the way they did. It's, it's hard for us to believe that they hated him so much that they murdered him, especially if you're like you and I who actually met him and encountered his love. But Jesus was radical. He was radical in turning things upside down in life. It's a lot like Martin Luther King, and I'm not comparing Jesus to Martin Luther King. There's no one like Jesus. But you know, Martin Luther King was murdered for a reason. There was, when Martin Luther King passed, there were more Americans who hated Martin Luther King than honored him. He was a hated man because he was constantly overturning what he believed American society should look like. Now, as we look back at Martin Luther King, we like to think that we love him now because we're a more tolerant society. But in fact, what we've really done is watered down his message to where it's palatable today instead of the true message that he preached about a radical transformation of our civil and economic society. We've done the same thing with Jesus. We preach a Jesus that fits in with every life on the planet. If you live for something, Jesus is there to help you get it. It is phantom Messiah syndrome. We get confirmations about things that God is not confirming at all. As a matter of fact, our radical Jesus is calling us up in far more times that we have our antenna on do not disturb. Have you ever had your intent on do not disturb when you know Jesus is probably calling you? You know you're going somewhere and you've got yourself on do not disturb me, God. You're in a conversation and you got do not disturb on and Jesus is trying to talk. Oh, we, we see something similar in John chapter 14, starting in verse 1. If you would read the word of God with me here, we're going to have it up on the screen. Jesus says this. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am, they, there you may be also. And you know the way, you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, 
We do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Father, we pray now that you would bless the reading of your word. You would bless the hearer. You would bless their lives. You would bless this time and that you would be present in the midst of this talk. In the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. 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 Listen, Jesus' words, we neuter them. But, but they are they are Radical. And he had disciples who he taught for years and he confused them constantly. But Jesus made some very exclusionary statements that you can't miss. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. There is no other way to the Father except through the Son. Have you ever seen those coexist bumper stickers? Love the thought hate the theology. It just simply is not true. There is a common thread through every decent religion on the planet. And this common thread is that they have discovered the truths of God, though they package it in packages that are unfaithful. Jesus always loves community and he loves community that loves one another. Every truly wicked religion is a religion that says you are more important than the people around you. And those who aren't in your religion are less people than you are. Jesus promoted a religion that said that we don't look at those people as beneath us. We are to lower ourselves and serve them. Jesus wants us to honor the people around us in a radical display of love. Cults want you to believe that we're the good people. They're the bad people. At the same point, Jesus made very clear that the only people going to the Father are those who enter through the Son. Jesus is radical in what he taught. That is a radical statement. And in many parts of our society today, that is called hate speech. I don't hate anybody and I don't want anybody to be hated. I don't know that God hates anyone. I do know there are things that God hates. I know there's behaviors that God hates. I also know that I'm not allowed to hate anyone. And if God wants to hate someone, that's between him and them. It's not our job to tell anybody who God hates. Are, are you hearing me? It is our job to love people radically, even if we think, and especially if we think God hates them. That is the radical message that people do not want to hear today. At no point has God called any person to hate anyone ever. He has not called us to hate people in the name of Jesus. That's hard. Have you noticed that? That's hard not to hate anybody. It's hard for me because there's people that I want to hate. And Jesus keeps taking me to task over my heart toward them. But it doesn't take anything supernatural to hate. It absolutely requires the love of God for me to love. Especially those who I want to hate. You know what I'm saying? Is anybody with me? I'm going to just keep asking you questions to make sure we're up and we're talking and we're all connecting today. But here in this, this saying that Jesus is talking, it's part of a, a section of John that's called the farewell discourse. Uh, this was spoken on Maudie Thursday, the Thursday before his crucifixion, and he's preparing his disciples for his departure. He knows that they love him, that they he's the Messiah and they expect to spend eternity with him on earth. But he's leaving and he's preparing them for that leaving. He's going to be murdered very soon and taken away from them. And, and, and he knows there's going to be so much grief among the disciples. And he's trying to prepare their heart. He's leaving little breadcrumbs in their heart that the Holy Spirit can bring to remembrance so they can properly discern in the future. I want to say that again because we don't get that. Jesus speaks things to us that are not for now. They are deposited in our spirit so the Holy Ghost later can remind us of those words for when they are applicable. When we receive prophetic ministry, the great temptation is to think it's a now word. And the great temptation of the one giving the word is that every word they think that they get is a now word. I'm going to tell you a little story. I was recently at a leader's retreat. 
And they were having, oh, okay, let me say this. I want to say this as graciously as possible. And I need you to hear this through the ears of grace, okay? So um, there was going to be a foot washing at this thing, right? And it was a pastor's gathering. And um, they were going to do a foot washing, and then the people washing your feet were going to prophesy. Um, now, now, the people doing most of the foot washing were the interns. And I was just like, this is a great sentiment, completely unbiblical, right? The point of foot washing was that those who are on top would serve the least. So what you do is you humble, as a leader, you humble yourself, and you wash the feet of the people who should be washing your feet. So here we are, and they have the interns washing the pastor's feet. I'm like... Nice sentiment, completely opposite of what the Bible teaches, but I will just trust that they're doing the best that they know how to do with what they have, right? God will honor this. And so what they said was they're going to wash feet and they're going to prophesy and you can, re- you can record the prophetic word as they give it to you. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm not doing that either, right? And so I sat down, washed my feet. I just, you know, trusted the Lord would speak. And I said to the guy, I said, hey, um, I appreciate this. I, I just, I know God is going to honor your act of humility here. Um, nothing personal, but I'm not recording the prophetic word, if that's all right. And he looked at me kind of strange, and I was like, the church went for about 2,000 years of not recording words, got the Bible. I think we'll be okay if I don't record this one. What happens is, as soon as someone starts recording the prophetic word, all of a sudden the words get longer, I've noticed. When someone has a microphone, a thought out there becomes a whole message up here. And I'm like, I, I just, I don't need a performance right now. I was at a place in Jesus where I was like, I don't need any more performances. I don't need any great swelling words. I definitely don't need you making up something in the name of Jesus, right? I don't want you to have any pressure that you would have a word from God for me, that you would speak for God to me, that you would become the mouthpiece of the everlasting, eternal the one who was, is, and is to come, the creator of all things, my creator and redeemer, the one who laid down his life for me, that I could be a son of God, that you would take his place and speak to me in such a profound word that I would need to record it lest I forget it. I feel like if God spoke something that clearly, I would remember the important parts. Are you with me? I know this is opposite of what you may have been taught in the past, but I'm like, if it's God, he'll remind me of what the important parts are. And so I just... I just, it worked for everybody in this book. <laughs> everybody in this book didn't have a tape recorder. Everybody in this book did not have an iPhone to record their prophetic word. And I feel like this book is pretty good. I've read it. Have you read the book? It's a really good book. If you haven't read it, it's really good. And it's got a lot of good stuff in it. And so I said, hey, why don't you just give me the word and um, I'll write down the things later that I think are, are pertinent. And so he began prophesying to me. Uh, and then he got a word and I was like, oh, that. That's that that was a word from God. This this was absolutely a word for God. And then he started explaining the word. And I was like, oh, that's absolutely not God. Like nothing that you're now explaining. Like you don't know me. You don't know my life. You don't know what I'm. And so in your mind, that's what that word would mean. But it's not what it actually meant, because I know what I'm going through. I know my relationship with God. I know what he was speaking to me in that word. And in your framework of bigger, better, more popular, more rich is all God would say. I I can see why you would think that's what it is. But God is actually with me in suffering right now. And so this word is speaking something you don't understand. You just had phantom prophetic syndrome. You thought you got a word that wasn't actually a word. It was what you had expected God to say after that word. So you spoke it. Are are you breathing right now? Is this making sense? And this is super important. It is super important that we understand that we don't know everything God is saying. And even more importantly, that when we get a word, we may not fully understand it when we receive it. Okay, let me, let me, does anybody remember? Now, I, I need y'all to be more awake than you've been recently. There's, a, there's an old rapper, and his name was Lil John. You remember Lil John? And he had a catchphrase. What was the catch, catchphrase he would say? He would say, what? Right? What would he say? What would he say? What? Let's say it together. Ready? What? Right? And he'd say it maybe again. What? And then he might say it again. What? But then he would say, yeah. <laughs> like he'd answer his own question after a while, right? What? Yeah. Right? That, that was, that was little John, right? So I want you to remember that, 
that 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 mentality while I explain three chapters of the Bible. OK. <clears throat> I, I want you to remember that. <clears throat> so this farewell discourse, as you remember in the in the Gospel of John, almost two thirds of John is about the last couple of weeks of Jesus life. The, almost all of his writing is about the last couple of weeks with the majority being the final week of his life. And in this farewell discourse, Jesus talks for three chapters. No iPod to record, to iPhone to record it, right? Like we have three chapters quoting Jesus, the words that he spoke. And, <clears throat> and the entire discourse, and I would love you to go back and read it, sounds a lot like the little John saying. We just read in John 14, 1 through 6, Jesus is like, where I'm going, there you may go also. And Thomas is like, what? Right? And then he would talk again. He was talking about the, the, the kingdom and the things that would happen. And then the Bible says, Thomas says, what? And then he would talk in. And then they stopped making the apostles look bad by saying, and some of the disciples said, what? Right? And then they get to John chapter, I mean, this is chapter 14, chapter 15. All you hear the disciples say is, what? And then Jesus would try to explain it a little bit more. Then they, they say, what? And then he'd talk a little bit more. And then he gets to chapter 16, verse 23. And Jesus says, in that day, you will not question me about anything. <laughs> Truly, I will say to you, if you ask the father, anything in my name, I will give it to you. And they're like, yeah, yeah. Right. That's the part they finally get. <laughs> oh, we get whatever we want. OK, now, now. And so they say here, verse 30. Now we know that, you know, all things <laughs> because I'm going to be successful. Now I know you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. We don't have any more questions, Jesus. Everything we ask, we're going to get. We have no more questions for you. By this, we believe that you have came from God. This, this is the confirmation that anything we ask in his name, we're going to get. This is their confirmation. He talks about his death. He talks about their persecution. He talks about the resurrection. He talks about the kingdom. He talks about their suffering. They don't understand any of that stuff. No idea what he's talking about. That stuff is like he's they're flushing it. Everything is like he's just flushing it right down the drain. Oh, I don't know what that means. Don't know what that means. Don't oh, we're finally going to get what we want. Oh, now we know. Now we know you're from God. And Jesus is like, now you believe. Really, now, now you believe, really, really, well, you, you, you're going to find out, right? Like you will find out where your faith is very soon. See, they heard what they wanted to hear. Phantom Messiah syndrome. They, they finally got the confirmation of what they were expecting. And if you read the book, I don't want to spoil the book for you, even though I hope you read it. If you read the book, you find out things do not go down the way they think they're going to go down. As a matter of fact, every one of these folks did not live a life any of us would expect to live in the name of Jesus. They heard what they wanted to hear. The Bible tells us that there's a, a great falling away of believers in times of trial. It even says even the elect will be deceived. In those days, why? Because they didn't get what they were expecting to get. They thought that they were going to be special. And I want you to understand in your walk with Jesus, the great temptation is that you would be treated as special. Now you are I have a meeting with my wife in therapy and she'll let you know how special God sees you, how you're just like the most important thing that ever walked the planet and that God wants you to be completely healed and whole. And then you come meet with me and I'm like, Jesus, in the middle of your suffering, he is actually doing something right now in this thing. And the season will not end until you learn what he wants you to learn because he is a faithful God. And so you may find yourself in one of these two places today. You may be going through some hard things. And you may be disappointed that God has not done what you wanted him to do. 
So much of the church today is telling people what they want to hear. We need to hear what God is really saying. I need you to hear this. So much of the church is promising things that are unfulfillable by God because God never promised them. We need to hear what God is really saying so we can be spiritually formed into disciples of God. You see, the disciples had no idea what Jesus was talking about. But in a day to come, when the persecution came, when the church was falling away, when people were apostatizing, when people were giving up, the Holy Ghost was reminding them of the words of Jesus. And they would then write epistles to the church of saying, this is the, these are the things that the Lord taught us. They were to sustain us. They were to keep us strong in times of trial because God is doing something significant on the inside of us. This Sunday, this past Sunday, we had a water baptism and people had encounters with God in the water. And that and, and I just I, can we just thank God for what he did. <clears throat> I'm, 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 I'm thankful. I'm thankful, but that, that is not the, the that's not the peak of your Christianity. It's not like I get water baptized. God touches me. And now I just wait until he takes me to heaven. If, if that were it, we would just dunk you. And leave you down and then just send you to heaven, right? It would be like a, just a, a pipeline to heaven. And now I just go on to heaven. Just come into the waters. Go to heaven, right? That, that it would be a. Direct, like we, we tell, we can market ourselves. We have a direct route to heaven at Revival Life Church. And like, then why are you a church of only 100? Because everybody's in heaven. I'm not getting in the water, right? Like, because it's not it. You got something to do here. And there's a learning process involved in water baptism. We made it very clear that water baptism is not the graduation. Water baptism is the welcome to the team. Now you have the spirit with you. The Bible tells us that you're sealed with the spirit at your water baptism. Now you have the Holy Ghost working in and with you as you begin to be transformed into the image of Christ. So that when tri trials come and when times of testing come, we have a spirit who is actually holding us in strength. So we can overcome any obstacle God has placed in front of us. So through our long suffering, we can be an example to the world that there is a living God. That we can know that in the midst of our confusion, there is a God who speaks and gives us a better way forward. Can you say amen? amen. We need to hear what God is saying. Because the God of your creation is the God of your redemption. We, 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 we tend to think that like I messed up. And I'm this way, but now God has created me to be a different person. You're the same person, just a better version. With the capability of tapping into the best version of you. The, the you that God created you to be. In John chapter 14, Jesus is telling the disciples that soon they'll no longer belong on earth. Soon there's going to be a society around them who hates them. And they're going to feel like they completely stick out. There's no place for them here. And they're, they're part of a kingdom that is not of this world. But just because you don't belong here does not mean you don't belong. He wants them to know that just because you don't feel like you fit in with the people around you, just because you don't feel that camaraderie, you don't feel like, oh, these are all my best friends. It doesn't mean you don't belong. I need you to hear that. See, we're not, we're not, we're not all friends in the church because we like the same movies or listen to the same music or are celebrating the triumphant eight seed Miami Heat whooping up on their opponent last night for the second time, even though they should have been eliminated in the first round. And now they're just, you know, continuing to dominate through the playoffs as we're all celebrating just because that's not what you're celebrating. Maybe you're mourning because you're rooting for the wrong team in this playoff season. We're not. And I say that, I need you to hear this. I say that as a joke, obviously, because who cares? In light of eternity, who cares, right? We attach our things to temporal. We attach our hearts to temporal things, things that will pass away. What brand of purse do you buy? What brand of shoes do you wear? Where do you go to have recreation? What gym do you belong to? How much money did you make in 2013? How much did you make in 2017? How much will you make in 2041? In light of eternity, it will make absolutely no consequence. We, we don't, we, we're, not, we're not friends because we all have the same view on who's going to be the best mayor of Boca 
or whether there should be dog leashes required on the beach. We're, we're friends because we have all met the same Savior. We are connected by the same Spirit. We all believe that Jesus Christ died for sinners. And it is our responsibility to tell them about a Savior who loves them. That they do not need to live a life of addiction. They do not need to live a life of oppression. They do not need to live a life of pain and suffering. They do not need to be alone. That God puts the solitary in family. Come on, amen. There's four people in my immediate family. Me, my wife, my son, and my daughter. And if you meet us individually, I don't know that you would think that we were all related. We all are very different people. Anybody else got a family like that? We're all very different people, uh, but we're all living off of my income. So we're all very. <laughs> There's a unity of supply. And some people don't 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 think that that's what unifies us until that stops. And then all of a sudden they recognize, yes, no, I do love you, dad. I do want to show you that you are important to me. I do want to spend a little time with you, if only to ask for the car or some money. I do want to spend some time together. But there's a unity of our family. There's a unity of experience. There's a unity of, of lineage. There's a unity that we have created by experience. This is why you don't have to, we don't have to be the same to belong. You don't have to belong because of agreement. We belong because we belong together. We're created and jointly fit together, the Lord says, like a body. Like my right foot, I'm like all of my shoes that look the same are completely different because they fit two different shoes. But I need both of them. I need two feet that look opposite. Otherwise, I'm going to fall over on one side. This is how we are in the body. You may be the, the, the shoulder socket and someone else is the liver. We need both. We're not a, we're not a, we're not a collection of livers. We're not, we're not a collection of ears. We are the body. We're different, but joined together for one purpose in Jesus Christ. There is something here for you because you are needed in this body. You may be here just because you're done living a trifling life. You may, you may be here just because I don't want to live there. And, and Jesus says, come on, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good for that. I'm, I'm good for helping you out of your. You may come faithfully to church because you are learning how not to be abused by the people around you. And to that, I say, come on. We got better things for you than even that. You may come because you have cycles of depression in your life. And this is just enough to get you through. I say, come on. You may come here because at home they speak down to you. And here people actually value you. And to that, I say, come on. That's the church. That's what the church is about. We're not all the same. But we all belong to the same body of Christ. Say amen. See, we need to learn when we come into Christ. And, and I just want to speak from my heart here. I want to speak from my heart. Um, I, we, 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 there's a rhythm of grace. There's a rhythm of grace. And when you get saved, we need to learn the rhythm of grace. See, see, I remember when I was lost, I had a rhythm in my life. There was a, there was a rhythm to my week. I worked certain days. Uh, the middle of the week, I didn't accomplish as much. Monday, I accomplished very little. Friday, I had to get a bunch of stuff done that I... Didn't get done during the week. Tuesday might be ladies night. So you know where you went on Tuesday night. Thursday night might be another night. So you go, you know, with the, Friday night is, you know, you don't work the next day. So, there, you know, there's a rhythm. There's a rhythm to it. You don't play anything Saturday morning because, you know, you're going to have some issues Sunday. Like there's, there's a rhythm. Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about here? There's a rhythm to your week that you learn. And then you come to Christ and we are sold in so many churches these days. We're sold of, of Jack and the Magic Beanstalk. Christianity, that if we just plant the right seed in the ground, we're going to climb to heaven magically and everything is going to be beautiful. And it's, that's not the God of the Bible and it's not the God of Christian history. What we do is we learn that there is a new grace that we walk in and we have to walk in it day by day. This sounds super boring, but it brings amazing life. We learn that we start our day in the word, talking to God. We realize that we live our lives trying to keep control of our tongue, 
trying to be an encourager instead of someone who tears people down. We try to be salt and light in the earth. And we end our day with prayer, reading the word, saturating it, praying over our sleep, praying over our family. We come to church every week because we know we need to sit under the preaching of the word. We're faithful to God in our finances. We intercede for the saints. We, we serve the body of Christ. There's a rhythm that we learn to walk in as Christians. And instead of Christ and his church being like, this is the best entertainment that might, you, might make you feel good about yourself. Instead, we learn, we come to church so that we can be built into the body of Christ, recognizing that what I do on Sunday morning, when I'm, I'm waiting for that divine appointment, I'm praying into Sunday morning, I'm coming with something to give, not just my offering. I'm coming knowing I'm going to give somebody a prophetic word. I'm going to give somebody a word of encouragement. I'm going to give somebody that little, that little compliment that's going to get them through the week. I'm going to call the person who missed church, letting them know, hey, are you sick? Can I pray for you? How can I help you? We learn these rhythms of grace. And here's what happens. As we learn the rhythms of grace, our life slowly begins to get transformed. We start being transformed into a new creature. We start taking on a different form, a different life. We start all of a sudden recognizing scriptures as we talk. The Bible that we've been meditating on is somehow in our spirit, man. And when we talk to people, Bible starts to come out. Has that, has that happened to you? You start to talk to people and you're witnessing to them and they're giving you arguments and you're telling them your story. And you're like, man, this is good. Someone should be writing this down. This is good stuff right here. I don't know where this came from. And sometimes you just go out and you just preach what you heard on Sunday. You just heard a good word on Sunday and you just preach it to the people around you. That's good. You could do that. that it's just it, every message, every sermon, they're all remixes. Nobody has their own sermon. I'm preaching what, what Jesus preached, right? Like I'm using his message and I'm calling my own and just sampling, right? I sampled part of it. Then I do my own part. I'm going to sample Paul in a second, right? And then I'm, it's, it's all remixes. And so you just preach it to people like it's your own. And you stop telling people, oh, I heard this guy say, that. just preach it. Just preach the word to people and get people to learn the rhythm of grace. Are you hearing me? This is what Peter was talking about. Peter talked about this in 1 Peter chapter 2. And if you just recently got baptized, I want you to really pay attention to this. He says, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted of the kindness of the Lord. You're like, all right. I'm complaining. So forgive me. I just I'm, I'm, I'm in a complaining season. If you were here on time when I went to read the psalm, I, I, I exalted in my complaining. Right. Like like Paul said, like I I brag in my lowliness. Like I brag in my I brag in my complaining. Right. So I, I, I'm 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 so heartbroken by Christians who are sold a bill of goods that aren't true. I want you to be stronger than that. I want you to be smarter than that. Baptism is not some graduation. It's not like, woohoo, I've arrived. I wish it were so. I wish I hadn't had a problem since water baptism. But what, but, but what has to happen is if I have to hype you up for that, then I got to hype you up to come to church. And then I got to hype you up to give. And, and I got I to gotta talk you into serving. And I got to, oh, no, 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 no. What I tell you is you're going to be like Jesus. And we're going to incorporate the disciplines of God into our life. And Peter says, listen, we have to long for the pure milk of the word like babies. So that we may grow in respect to salvation. We grow in our salvation. We need to come to the Bible each day. This is the rhythm of grace. We come to the Bible each day. We read and we pray over what we read. So we can be formed. Pray in the spirit if you've been given your, 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 your heavenly language. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Seek God. Watch this. Verse 4. In coming to him. As to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices <clears throat> acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So when they would build a building, you got to make sure that your, your walls are straight, right? And you want your walls to be at a 90 degree angle because if they're off, they're going to be unstable and they can fall over if it's not perfectly straight if it's too in and they can fall out if it's too far out they can't lean on each other and it could fall in and kill the people and so what we need it to be is perfectly square to one another 
And the way you do that is you get your absolute best stone. The most perfectly cut stone. And you lay it as the cornerstone. And you put this cornerstone down and you say, every wall that I build off of this wall will be built according to the angles on this stone, this cornerstone. This cornerstone is the most important stone in this entire building. And the Bible here says we come to him as a living stone, which was rejected by men. Anybody know what I'm talking about on that one? Life did not go well. And then you came to Jesus. The world said that you weren't going to amount to nothing or the, you, you would lay in bed at night and think of all the things that might go wrong and have gone wrong. And you come to Jesus with all your issues, all your flaws, all your imperfections, your anxieties and your depression. And he says, you're rejected by men, but a choice and precious in the sight of God. So, so, so the world said you're a stone that we may just like hold up the dirt with over there. You're a stone that we may use as a walkway. But Jesus is like, no, I bet I can use this one in the world the way the world never knew. And in that, he says that we're stones, but we're living. We're living and we are building, we are building, being built up. So we become a cornerstone for a house that God himself is building. We need to view God through the season that you're in right now. And here's the prophetic word that I have for you today. And I'm going to, you're not going to be able to write it down. I need you to hear it with your spirit, man. Because I believe God dropped this in my spirit this week. And I've been trying to process it all week. We need to view God through the season we're in right now. <clears throat> it's not a word of faith if you're denying your trial. Like, you're, it's, it's not a failure of faith if you recognize your depression, if you recognize your frustration, don't be ashamed because you're anxious. I mean, you know how many times the Bible says not to be anxious? By some estimations, it's over 360. And so what I have heard people say, the Bible says 365 times not to be anxious, one for every day, so you should never be anxious. Or... He knew you were going to be anxious and you needed a reminder every day. There's a God who's aware of your anxiety and you are not alone in the midst of it. When you have anxiety, don't deny it, but go to the God who recognizes your anxiety and ask him to help in your weakness. Can you say amen? Yeah, that makes a little more sense to me. Have you ever told yourself I shouldn't be anxious? Doesn't actually fix anything. Have you noticed that? Doesn't fix anything. All it does is make you feel worse. And if God has a preferential option for the poor and a preferential option for the hurting, that means when you recognize the season you're in, in a valley, then you can find Jesus in the valley. If you're looking for mountaintop Jesus and you're in the valley, you're going to have a hard time seeing him. Come on, somebody. If you recognize you're in the valley and you're like, Lord, I am in the valley and I, you're in the Psalms, you're in the impectory Psalms where Jesus is, com or excuse me, where David is complaining and you're like, I feel that. And then you get to the end of the Psalm where David is declaring that even in this, I'm going to see God. You're like, well, then maybe that is for me as well. But it starts with you recognizing where you're at and being real about where you're at. And here's what I would like to say to those of you who have received so many prophetic words in the past and you have possibly not seen them come to pass. Anybody in here got some unfulfilled prophetic words in your life? Can you be honest? There's just a few prophetic words you've gotten that have not been fulfilled yet. If, 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 if you don't have any unfulfilled prophetic words, we can line you up over here at the end and have somebody just make stuff up. Because sometimes that's what it feels like those prophetic words are like. Here, here's what I would challenge you. And this is what I believe the Lord spoke to me earlier this week. It might be time to dust off some old prophetic words you received and reinterpret what they mean based off what you know now in the season you're in now. Hear me for a second. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm just want to teach here for, for, for a hot second, if I could. Getting a prophetic word doesn't make you spiritual. God can speak through a donkey, right? That means that you have risen to the level of donkey spiritually, all right? You are, you are capable. He, he spoke from a flame, right? Uh, 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 so you're as spiritual as a bush, all right? That's awesome. 
We're super happy for you. That's amazing. You're just amazing. Surprised they wrote the Bible without you, right? But the, 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 the real prophetic part comes from the interpretation and the application. What does this word mean? And so often we get a prophetic word and we automatically know what it means because we base it on the season we're in right now. Let me say it again. You are hoping for something and you get a prophetic word that something is coming and therefore you tie it to what you're hoping for in that season. That's probably a problem. And so we tie it to what it means and that, you know, yeah, just, it's, just, it's just falling, flaming things. You know, that can't be bad, right? We, we did pray for fire from heaven. We'll probably look at that later. You know, okay. Yeah. So, so, so hear me. Hear me. If you've received prophetic words, this is going to be helpful. So we get a prophetic word. Follow me for a second. And we instantly interpret the prophetic word, right? And we rarely hold on to the prophetic word. We hold on to the interpretation. So in the next season, we're still holding on to the interpretation from the old season. All right. Now, say you're in this season and seasons, you, things are great. Things are wonderful. You got the prophetic word. I'm going to be rich and famous. Everything's going to be amazing. And then you move over into this prophetic season and things are not awesome. Maybe in this season, when you got the word, you were being abused. Maybe you're in an abusive church system. Maybe you were in a system that you that, that you fled from. Maybe you're in a relationship that was ugly. Maybe you were in a system of life and you come over here and you look at that system and you're like, I don't even believe the things I believed over there anymore. I don't, I'm, I'm like, that's not even part of who I am anymore. And now you're saying in order for that prophetic word to come to pass, do I have to go back there? I don't I don't I don't want to go back there. But how do I get that prophetic word here? You're holding on to the interpretation you got in this season. Are you following this at all? You have built a belief system around that prophetic word based on where you were at at the time. So now you're over here in this season, you got that prophetic word and you're still holding on to what it meant over there. I talked to a man recently and he's like, wow, I, um, I went to Boca and uh, Boca, like, it's, it's not that nice anymore. I'm like, what, what, are you, what, are you, what are you talking about? I'm like, he's like, well, I lived here as a teenager. And uh, well, I was like, do you think that you really had an accurate understanding of Boca Raton as a teenager? Do you, are you serious? You're like, like, really? Have you ever gone back to your childhood home and you're like, did this thing shrink? Like, what happened? I thought it was big. It's tiny. No, no, no. Because your understanding of your home in that season is very different than your understanding of your home in this season. And, and, and so you long for a home that you had, but that home no longer fits you. And so we get this prophetic word and we hold on to the interpretation of that word. And sometimes we need to dust off those old prophetic words and look at them through the now that I'm in. Not into the hopes I had then. Is this helping anybody? Yeah. yeah. And so you pull those out and you're like, all right, well, what does, what does success look like today for me? What, what would breakthrough look like today? Now, there's some prophetic words you need to dust off and then just keep dusting right to the trash. They just go into the dust bin, right? They get dusted off and then they go into the dust bin, right? Other ones you're like, well, maybe that didn't mean what I thought it meant. And, and what it means in this season is even more significant than what it would have meant, what you thought it meant back there. See, we, ha we, we, we got to have, we got to stop with the phantom confirmation syndrome. <laughs> we wanted something and the prophetic word confirmed it. It's like when I talk to teenagers about getting tattoos. And I say, please don't. P please, please don't. Because when I talked about Lil John, I guarantee you someone got a, a Lil John tattoo in 2002. And they're going to have to be explaining to people, well, he had gold teeth. And he would say, yeah, yeah. And they're like, why? why um, but that doesn't explain why you would get that tattoo, tattooed on your body. I don't. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, but, but, but why would you? I don't, I don't get it. Well, at the time, it seemed good. Well, you just made that permanent, right? So I'm like, just don't. I know that tattoo sounds clever, but in 15 years, it's going to sound dumb, right? Like, it just, just trust me on this, right? It, right. And so we tattoo these words on our heart 
for a season and we're no longer in that season. Are, are you feeling me? Are, 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 are we? Are we are they, I appreciate it, Mikey. I, I do appreciate that. So we have this expectation based on what we believed about God and it colors what we hear God saying. So these disciples, they thought God was saying something. They thought Jesus was saying something. And they had no grid for what he was saying that did not confirm what they wanted to hear. And it wasn't until they heard what they wanted to hear that they actually thought they got a word from God. And Jesus is like, I'm just speaking into your spirit, man, because you're going to need these things later, even though you don't understand them now. And I would say that many of us have prophetic words that were spoken into our spirit for a season that we could not even see when we received it. And now we need to dust them off and say, what does that actually mean about now? Amen. In this new season, you have a whole new worldview. But if you have this word in your heart that no longer fits into this season, you're like, well, what do I do with it? You're either left with believing the word was wrong somehow or somebody blew it or maybe the time has passed on that word. But we have a God that took three generations for one word to come to pass, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They waited ever since Abraham for the Messiah to come. Jesus was giving them prophetic words that wouldn't be fulfilled for 30 and 40 years. Jesus, can we sit on your left and your right? And Jesus said, oh, the time is coming, but not yet. It would be 30 years for some of them before they were murdered in the way he was murdered. And I doubt that they took that word to mean they would be murdered the way he was murdered. <laughs> but as Paul grew closer to it, he was like, ah, I get it now. I am being poured out as a drink offering. I am coming closer to my true prophetic destination. But when Paul got saved, probably, probably, probably unlikely that he would have been able to receive that word. Oh, this is, oh, is going to be life for somebody. I hope you hear it. The problem is we start to despise prophecy because of the disappointment of not, these words not coming to pass. Stephen, Stephen was preaching about a kingdom that he had never seen. Stephen was a disciple, but he wasn't one of the apostles. We know that he was a deacon in the church, and uh, he was doing great signs and wonders. And so, you know, we're going to have a deacon test here soon, and you have to do signs and wonders, and then we might make people deacons. Uh, that's a joke. Stephen saw Jesus... <laughs> And was a deacon in the church of Jesus Christ. And as Stephen was being murdered, he finally saw the kingdom that he was prophesying. I, 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 want, you to, I want you to really hear this. I, I, I want you to get this. Through death is a new beginning. And so when we get water baptized, this is, it's not the end. It's, it's the beginning of something new. And as Jesus causes deaths in our life, there's a new beginning that comes through it. Time and again, Jesus talks about the seasons and in the winter, anywhere other than Florida, and I don't know why you would live anywhere other than here, but in other places, the ground freezes and everything dies. And in springtime, things come to life. And in this death, there's a new beginning and nobody comes to the father except through Jesus. And you have to die to life as you built in order to come into the new beginning that you get in Jesus. The people who incorporate Jesus into their lives, you know these people, they kind of go to church, they have maybe some, every now and then there's a social media story about church and their social media, and the rest of the time they're living for the devil, right? And then you just see after a while, there isn't lifelong transformation, there isn't fruit that remains because they never actually died before coming to life. But you are being built into something in God. Let me tell you this right now. You, you, may, you may feel like you have had a long season of death. You may feel like you have had a long season of disappointment. You may feel like you have had a long season of grinding, but you are not the stone that God rejected. Your life is the stone that the world has rejected. God has received you as a choice stone. He has received you as something that he is going to build something 
great through. I want to speak to your heart right now. If you've been in disappointment and you have been in failure and you have wondered why things have not worked, I'm here to let you know God is building something in your life and through your life right now. Come on, somebody. You were broken and bruised, but God has used that abuse to help someone else. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You were in a bad relationship, but you were able to find somebody in a bad relationship and say, sister, I've been there and look at the scars on my back. I didn't think I would make it through, but I made it through. And now I can save you from going through the same thing. You see, I was rejected, but now God is using my rejection to build something bigger in somebody else's life to keep them out of the pain. Listen, you were broke, but God is using that season of poverty that you had in the past. And when he begins to bless your finances, he will make you a generous person who will fill in the gap that you wish somebody filled in your life when you were broke. God is building you through these trials. You will be the one who will not despise the poor, but you'll actually be able to be a Christ follower and help those who have less. You were lied to, and you were hurt by people in your life, and you laid in bed, and you said, Jesus, why? Why was my reputation ruined like that? Why are people that I love treating me this way? You may have been walking in a depression because of it, but God is using that so that you will not allow injustice to happen in front of you. You will not allow people to gossip around you. You won't allow other people's reputations to be torn down around you. God is using your season of trial to build something bigger. Can you say amen? He's doing something in your life right now. And you may be at the beginning of this stage or you might be in the pit right now saying, pastor, that sounds good, but I am not enjoying it. And I say, yes, it's not supposed to be enjoyable. I, I feel you. But this is where you learn things. And if you're in the midst of that pit right now, if you're in the belly of the beast, as it were, I'm here to let you know a day is coming because seasons end and a day of breakthrough is coming. I'm here to let you know. And God is going to use every stripe that was on your back to bring healing to the nations. God is building a place of belonging for you. I'm going to say it again. God is building a place of belonging for you because he's building a place of belonging in you. He's building a place of belonging. Come on, somebody. You may have felt all alone in this world. You may have felt like you connected to nobody. And because of that feeling, you will not leave somebody alone in the corner. You will not leave people behind. You will not leave the hurt hurting. You will not leave the sick sick. You will not leave those with potential. You won't look at them as a threat, but it's your pleasure to push them up, to make them greater. God is doing something through your pain. This is the God of your redemption. He created you and saw you in that pit and he will redeem that for his glory. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Broken people failed at life. You have struggles. God is going to use them to be the cornerstone of something great. Let me prophesy that into your life right now. He will use it as a cornerstone of something great. Every testimony, come on, somebody, starts with a test. Jesus said, I am creating a place of belonging. In John, they thought, they thought that finally, they were finally going to get some mansions. Jesus said, I'm, I have many houses. And he's like, oh, where, where have they been? Where we've been sleeping by the side of the road. We've been sleeping in little tents. We've been sleeping on the ground and rejected. I'm building mansions for you, he said, we read. And they're like, finally, finally, we're going to rule and to conquer. Finally, we get these mansions. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Where I'm going, I'm creating a place of belonging. This is what he's doing. He's creating a place of belonging in Jesus. There is a belonging in Christ that we all get to partake on. Let me, let me have the band come up, if you would, please. We're just going to play a little bit. And... Join me in Acts chapter 7, if you would. Do, 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 do the third song. Third. Stephen, who was a deacon, serving the church of Jesus Christ. We know he wasn't an apostle. He didn't get to get up on the mountain and watch Jesus get transfigured. 
We know that he didn't get to hand out the multiplied bread and fish. He didn't get to put his hand in the Lord's side. But now he's a deacon in the church teaching people about the kingdom of God. And as he's preaching about the kingdom of God, he did not have a place of belonging on the earth. Oh, but there was a place of belonging for him. Hear me. Watch this. Acts chapter 7, verse 55. Just play it without the track. Just play it. Just play it. We're just going to flow for a second. Is that all right? You all all right with that? Yeah, yeah just play it. We're just going to sing. You all right? We're just going to sing. Watch this. Acts chapter 7. But being full of the Holy Ghost. Who wants to be full of the Holy Ghost? Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. So Stephen's on the earth, suffering for Jesus. Being full of the Holy Ghost, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and he said behold I see the heavens opened up and the son of man standing at the right hand of God they cried with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse when they driven him out of the city they began stoning him and the witnesses laid aside their robes at his feet a young man named Saul they went on stoning Stephen and called on the Lord and said Lord Jesus receive my spirit falling on his knees he cried out with a loud voice Lord do not hold the sin against them and having said this he fell asleep I believe in that moment Stephen was never more alive when you tap into your purpose When you tap into the reason Jesus put you on earth to bless the lives of the people around you, you are never more alive. When you serve the body of Christ, when you are faithful to the church of Jesus Christ, you're never more alive. You're finally functioning within the purpose you were created. And here's Stephen preaching. Though dying never more alive. Stephen saw it. He finally saw the exalted Christ. And let me tell you, in your hour of trial, you will see Jesus as well. Let me say it again. If you find yourself in a trial today, you will see Jesus in the midst of it. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't fold. Don't run. Don't hide. Be fully present in the midst of your pain. Be fully present in the midst of your trial. Be fully present in the midst of the betrayal. Be fully present in the midst of your poverty. Be fully present and fully awake, fully alive to Jesus. And you're going to watch him reveal himself to you in ways you never thought were possible. Stand with me, do it, please. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Listen. I just want us to finish with uh, just singing a little bit of this song. I feel, this, I feel a sweet spirit in this room. Let me tell you what I'm feeling right now. The Holy Spirit is doing. And, um, huh, huh, huh. God is now healing hurt and disappointment. But hear me. I need you to hear this. We, we unknowingly build our lives on things other than the... I don't want this to sound as condemnation. But sometimes we find out we have to start over again. I built something. I thought I was going in the right direction, but it wasn't. But in all that, God is growing you into the image. He's been feeding you the word. You're just not building what you thought you were building. And for some of us, 
when you find out midstream you built something you don't actually like. It doesn't line up with the promise of God. is isn't satisfying the way you thought it would be satisfying. We have to die to what we did. We have to die to what we had committed our lives to. We have to die to a prophetic word that we thought meant something, that it means something else. Could be a relationship, could be a a business could be could be a million things. But as you surrender and you bury that thing, there will be new life. And I wanted to sing this song because I want you to build your life on his love. Not on anything else he could give you, but when you build your life on the truth of who he is, it is a firm foundation that you can build other people around you. Worthy of every song we could ever sing.